Good morning all and welcome back to our monthly CPD webinar series. This time all about verification of ground gas protection systems. I'm your host Andy Ferguson from the Property Care Association and joining me to, I suppose, help steer you through this minefield is PCA senior trainer and MD of his own training and development company, Neil Salvage. Good morning, Neil. Good morning, Andy. Thank How you. How are you good, sir? I'm good, thanks. And you? Not bad, buddy. Not bad. Now, for all those that have been tuning into our broadcast in the past, and especially just over the COVID-19 weekly broadcast, just want to say a big hello and, and welcome back to, I suppose, what was our original format, this uh, monthly broadcast. If you are a new listener, though, a big welcome to you. And as always, I hope you get some real good valued learning from today. And on top of that as well, that you enjoy the chat. Now, I also know that we actually have quite a few international listeners on this morning, I believe as far as New Zealand and Australia. Big, big thanks for tuning in, guys. I don't know what the time is over there. I imagine it's daft o'clock, but a big, big welcome to you. Now, guys, just before we kind of go into kind of things, um, I just want to make you aware of that if you want to kind of pose any questions over the course of the webinar, just how you can do that. Uh, first place I point you to is to the chat facility that we have. Now, if you're on a laptop or a desktop, that chat facility should either be depending on your settings on the left or the right of your screen. Uh, you should have a comment box in there. Uh, all you need to do is just get those fingers rattling and say a big hello to us. If you are on a mobile device, the chat functionality is just a little bit down. You just need to kind of just pull the screen up a wee bit and you will see a box in there that says type to comment. Um, if you're on live now, give us a big hello. I can see those folks on there at the moment in time. Good morning, all. There is alternative ways, however, you can pose questions to us over the course of the webinar. First place I would point you to is to send an email to myself. It's just simply at andy at property-care.org. That's andy at property-care.org. Or alternatively, if you are so socially savvy, you can go via our social media channels. Either visit our Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn channels. Um, use the native search functionality that's on there. Simply type Property Care Association and we should pop up. Um, I just also want to just kind of bring your attention to that um, I'm aware that it, it, it is almost nine o'clock. Everyone's turning on their PCs. There's generally quite a surge and um, a, a demand on the internet. If for any reason that you have any problems or this webinar crashes, you should have a button that pops up on your screen that kind of allows you to automatically reconnect. And for those of you that are on the chat, if you do see anyone on there that's having any problems, if you just want to mention that reconnect button that should pop up, that would be fabby. Worst case scenario as well, guys, is that we always have a recording of this available a couple of days later. So I will ensure that you get that over to yourself. So um, Neil, I suppose we've got a couple of minutes to kind of kill just before we kind of go live and we'll just wait for uh, people to kind of join us. Firstly, great to have you back, mate. Now, I don't know, just for those listeners that are unaware, Neil headed up one of our webinars back in May, Ground Gas, Why Bother? I mean, Neil, I mean, how has lockdown been for you? Um, well, it's been well, obviously testing as it is for most of us, I think, you know, first of all, you know, the work side of things has been very uh, up and down. Um, some construction projects have been, you know, still active and I've been getting calls to, to pop out, obviously doing my assessment work with my MBQ uh, level two learners um and you know obviously dealing with all the things that are going on at home as well because the two have clashed quite significantly so uh you know it's it's been a, a challenging time and i think we're coming you know slowly a new normal's coming to light and uh you know it's it's certainly an interesting time and uh, you know it's it's a way of adapting some of it i find quite good actually i'm enjoying it more and finding why didn't i do this before you know? yes <laughs> well it's, uh, it's we have the same at the pc as well I mean, when you when you think of like tools like Zoom and just the ease of being able to kind of coordinate meetings with multiple people and just have it in the screen face to face, you think to yourself, "Wow, it takes it takes a pandemic for us to embrace it." 
Well, look, th this is the engagement I've had with some of our learners, like doing Skype or Teams or Zoom calls. It's been really, you know, and I've actually had a couple of my learners going around site with their mobiles, dem you know, demonstrating work activity and showing me product, which is, is, is really valuable stuff, you know. So uh, it's it, it saved me a journey, you know, quite a long way <laughs> to go yeah. and do it. But obviously, I, I still like the face to face. It's still a valuable part of my assessment tool and, and working with practical people at the end of the day. Yeah, very quickly, because I'm conscious of time, but the last time we chatted, I know you were working behind the scenes on a new ground gas, um, ground gas course, a two-day. Now, I know that's coming up, and I think in the next four weeks. How are you yeah. feeling about it? Yeah, I'm get, I've got quite a lot of content. Obviously, we had a dry run with um, some, you know, really helpful uh, members came along to support that initial dry run. We've taken on board some of their comments and ideas, and that's moving forward. So, um, yeah, it's going to be like the detail, um, you know, because of the two elements. It's I know people say it's a design course. Well, no, it's it's a design stroke detailing. It's how the two work together, you know, and how. Well, I'll, I'll touch on a bit of that today, actually, in the verification program uh, mm. uh, seminar. So. Fantastic. Well, guys, I, I am kind of conscious of time. Just for those that are kind of joining us, um, just to let you know that if you do have any questions over the course of the webinar, first place I just want to point you to is over to the chat functionality. You can find that on your desktop and laptop just to the left or the right-hand side. On mobile devices, if you just scroll up, you'll see it there. But alternatively as well, if you want to email any kind of questions over to us, you can just simply email it to me, just andy at property-care.org. That's andy at property-care.org. Um, Neil, I can see it's actually bang on nine o'clock just at the moment. Neil, the last time I remember you tackled, are we making a mountain out of a molehill when it comes to ground gas protection? That one, I know you smashed it. <laughs> um this time i suppose the webinar challenge kind of steps up i'm going to be stealing your words here but i remember you telling me from initial con conception to final sign off and everything in between well i suppose it's over to yourself neil to tell us all about it and the verification of ground gas protection systems over thank to you yourself good sir thank you andy well good morning everybody and it's really great to have you all on board this morning thanks for joining us um just a, a little introduction to myself, I'm Neil Selvage. Um, been active in the ground gas sector since the mid 90s. Uh, I started out um, as a technician. Uh, I've always been a construction based uh, worker since I left school, did my time as a joiner and very active in um, now developing the standards and supporting um, better practice. I think it's key that good practice comes to the fore for everybody during the course of their working activity. We all go out to do a good job at the end of the day. Um, so I, I really enjoy supporting training bringing people along giving the best out of them so hopefully today's um content is going to be very valuable to all those that have joined us and i'm trying to hit as many ends of the the spectrum of uh people involved in the process as possible um because there are some areas which might be kind of left a little bit neglected or a little bit unknowledgeable so so let's move on to the verification well my first insights into verification were when Somebody came on site and started spraying marks over the membrane and they were spotting holes. Well, OK, yep, we're finding faults. Verification is the kind of checking and confirming that things uh, comply, that they're, they're fit for purpose. They're doing their job. And often the words verification and validation are kind of merged together here. I think the validation is the, um, the prior process of putting something together to make sure that the verification is, is going to be uh, sufficient. So we can see there uh, an eagle-eyed verification officer been on site and spotted various holes. My next image that I, I put up and those that have joined me on trainings that I do, I always pop this slide up. This is a classic example of our, our arch enemy, the follow on trade coming along and doing um, well, as we can see, the still saw has been, been in action. And I don't think you need to be uh, super observant to see that the membrane has been compromised at this point. So verification played out and measures had to be taken to improve the system. One that I'm finding more um, prominent today is that the gas membranes will be specified to a project, part of the remediation strategy. And often sites will say, oh, that's fine. We can accommodate this. We've done it before. And this was only a couple of weeks ago where I was at a project in Wales where a gas membrane or a membrane 
had been put in for the perimeter. We can see it there acting as a DPC, put in by non-specialist, non-gas membrane trades. And there was no attention, or we know of no attention to the details. So you can see where the membrane sits on the, the perimeters there. Had they cornered the details? Have they done the threshold? Have they linked into any pipes? No, nobody had verified that particular part of work because they stipulated that the gas membrane is the element that needs verification and checking. So we're going to line out the inside of that building today. Um, but there was very little knowledge from the people putting that initial membrane in of what gas protection was needed for. What, it, what, what did it involve? So this is a common hurdle that I'm up against when um, I'm attending site and certainly dealing with the, the construction phase of the project. And hopefully we'll cover that during the course of this morning. So let's rewind a little bit. The verification isn't just about finding those pinholes. So in 2014, Syria published um, 735, C735, and we give credit there to the authors, the four authors for that document. And that was a kind of game changer in the industry. A lot of you that are working in um, the gas protection sector will hopefully be very familiar with this document. And what I'm going to be covering today will be, yeah, I've seen that before. And those that have been on training also will have seen elements of this before as well. So the building of the gas protection system, um, like anything, we form a circle. There's a lot of investigation goes on, and I'll talk about the, the site investigation a little bit later on. Assessing the risks. This is a key part of what that site is um, built on, what the potential hazards in the ground or the, the, the hazards nearby that could potentially impact onto that building. The design. Now, everything falls into the design. I, I'd like to first emphasize that the detailing that goes on forms the design. So it's all the small elements that link together to give the big main element of the design. And that was all being done very diligently, really well. Um, but the install was the area where I think 735 was kind of um, pushed towards being authored because there was a lot of failed systems or a lot of unnecessary systems going in. People heard the word I'm on contaminated land. They would just put one system in and there was an assumption that one system fitted all scenarios. Well, that's very much not the case. And so hopefully with the verification or the, the validation stages of this, things can be clarified. So the first um, reference we have to the British standard 8485 is on table seven, where um, 735 is a normative reference. So it's actually written into this um, the guidance document that for our membranes to be sufficient and you know conform to all these uh, elements you can see here and we've got the, the test for the um, the manometric test for permeability of the products are they going to survive the build pro process are they going to be strong enough to withstand movement within the building but are highlighted there at the bottom um, it's got to be verified there must be some form of verification now this is can vary according to the risk of the site and we'll talk about that in a moment but you can gain two points here in your design of the system. And we'll talk about the point scores on the next slide. So here we are on British Standard 8485. Um, this is the amended version, which came out last year with the points highlighted. Um, they had to be revised because some of the previous points were quite difficult to get. Um, <laughs> so here we can see uh, different CS characteristic situations from one to six highlighted against different building types. So type A is your domestic dwelling, privately owned. And as you can see, three and a half points there on a CS2 site. So your membranes are forming two points of that system. And we'll talk about the balance of points, what else you need to bring that up to get that score. So you can see all different building types and all different ground conditions. They're all, they've all got different equations that they need to fulfill to, to tick the verification boxes. But this is one of the, the elements that I get kind of, um, I don't know, some verifiers I meet on site, how well they've looked at this, because the CS, the characteristic situ the situation of the site, is drawn up by our geotechnical consultants, our risk assessors. These are specialist people that work in this field. Um, this won't be done by the verifier, not always. Some consultants will offer verification services as well, but some verifiers don't do the site investigation. It's not their role. But understanding where this CS is been calculated, how it complies to the particular project that you're you're involved with. 
And we also have the NHBC have a traffic light system. So a lot of you will be familiar with, you're either going to get one of those, especially if you're NHBC with um, housing projects, the green, amber one, amber two, and red. So this, this again, complies to what our conceptual site model is. So the, again, site investigation and risk assessors will be doing a desk study there. We can see a gentleman having a look at various documents. We look at all the geology is looked at. The historical um, elements of the, the site, one that I particularly like is the site walkover, <laughs> having a chat with the, the, the neighbour over the fence, the topography of the site. And the bottom right there is the most awkward one because often people will have land but don't know what they're going to do with it. So um, I thought putting those together, it gives you an insight and the verifier should have a, an understanding that this has been, this conceptual site model has been formed by the specialists, the risk assessors, to to kind of put the first steps of the remedi remediation strategy in place. Yeah. But as I say, it's not always the verifier's role. They, they won't do this, but some of them, consultants out there, might say, well, we do this, which fits amicably with the, the start process, and process of the verification process. And it also ties in with the very end phases, which we'll come to obviously at the end. So as I mentioned earlier on, um, it's the design of the system. 8485 talks about design. And I always look at it as a jigsaw because there's multiple people, multiple decisions have to be made. So it's not really one person that is, OK, you will have a principal designer, but there's a big team that sits behind that. And I always like to look at the specialist consultants, the risk assessors for the site investigation. We've got structural engineers as well. So when we go back to look at the formation of where the site is going to be developed, structural engineers will look at the, for example, the load bearing of the slab and the, the piling depths and the, the structures. So again, that's another specialist en engineering element that needs to be considered and verified or, or validated that it's, it's there, it's been looked at. So we're starting to form some of the elements that we should be looking in verification. Now, I'm going to draw a line here because we also look at the installation and we look at the components. So there are key parts because the structure, will everything fit into place? Can it fit in the correct sequence? Is it going to cause additional problems? Now, you might have to go back. You might spot something from your experience and knowledge that you want to put back to the structural engineer to say, we've seen that you're going to be doing X, Y and Z, but we've got to fit in A, B and C into that. How does it work? So there could be some meetings that go on, some discussion, some sharing of details. And that's the key thing. It's the sharing details. And, you know, we get standard working details. People might have to do bespoke specialist details. And I'll show you some examples of those that come up later on. But the verification sits in a line. Some of it, the verifier will cross over into. They might ask questions to the site investigation people, consultants or the structural engineers. And likewise, they might ask questions on the components, on their suitability, compliance with 8485, but also verifying that it's, it's in when they actually go to site. So knowing the precursors before the, the actual work takes place. So what makes up the balance of the point score? Well, we've got the structural barrier, the foundations. Um, they are an element that will, again, give various point scores depending on how they're structured. And 8485 gives details on that. So we can look at some floors where we, we might have piles, for example, or a beam structure. But we also look at ventilation. Ventilation is a very effective way of producing a void that's going to disperse the air. So with the verification of this, do you verifiers go out and check the ventilation and do you check the shrub structure? Because from my experience, I'm going to speak from the heart here. I often meet verifiers. Their very first visit is when they're coming out to look at membranes often very difficult to look at the, the, the um, subgrade that they're working on. They might refer to drawings. They might have access or minimal access to it. But looking at ventilation sometimes cannot be achieved. You know, an, an example there, we've got some cuspated void former that's commonly used on various projects. One thing that I see a lot, it's put in upside down because of the way it rolls out. So using the wind and using the, the voids under the floor, it's a very good way of dispersing. Some ventilation systems will actually re might be needed to be proven that they're effective and they're going to perform well. This is where calculations are required. Again, we might have to go back. Well, we will have to go back to our specialist 
risk assessors, designers, because they can tell us how they can dilute that void. You know, how much air do you need to pass through to dilute the ground gases that are coming through? So are you going to that's not a verifier's job, but the verifier will possibly look at the figures that are put in front of them to say, oh, right, OK. And it's provable. Yeah. So there are calculated dilution um, is available. Yeah. So just saying, yeah, it looks good to me and tick the box. Then there needs to be some proof on that. OK. So when we look at the individuals involved in the uh, verification process, I think it's like a lot of things that they have to be experienced, suitably trained and competent. Now, um, and that quote is taken from 735 and have immediate access to appropriate technical support when needed and necessary. So, um, you know, are you going to make a phone call to somebody to ask a question? As I said earlier, you might have to go back to the, the structural engineer. You might have to go back to the risk assessor and the site investigation consultant to ask, to clarify. So these are all your prerequisites of verification. Yeah. So I showed you the slide earlier on and sending the least experienced newbie to your practice or to your operation to encounter an issue like that arose on the particular slide that I showed you first thing that I've just popped up again. Um, it could be quite a baptism of fire for that particular uh, officer to go and look at, to understand. They really need to know, well, why has this happened? In this particular instance, the membrane was actually left exposed from its initial sign off with the installer for four days before the verifier turned up. And that verification, obviously, the damage was done. There was quite a bit of work to do to repair it. And also a lot of friction generated on site because concrete pours had to be delayed. There was cost implications. And ultimately, they need to be a third party doing this verification in inspection work. Um, and we'll talk about that later on because there is a, um, a mention of technicians doing some of this work, which they will do, but they're not doing the full verification of the of, of their own installation. So I'll, I'll cover that again later on. Yeah. So I sat down and I tried to do a little bit of a, I don't know, a, design, a, a drawing of who sits where and does what. Now, obviously, all projects, I could have done this about six or seven different times in different formations to see where verifiers sit. They might come in through the geotechnical consultant side. Um, I wanted to add in there as well a ground gas risk assessor because that's a key point at that, that part of the, the, the planning or the people involved. So talking to the designers, the engineers of the project that links it back to the project team. As you can see, I've put the geomembrane contractors and the gas membrane installers. Now how they are engaged in the project they might come through the client, they might come through the project management team, they might even come through the ground workers. Um, it can get quite complicated who's, whose line of responsibility sits where and who appoints who to do the work. So I ultimately think that, you know, that the independence of the verifier, it's in the client's interest. But we often hear cases where the, the verification engineer is employed by the geomembrane contractor, for example, because often it is a last minute phone call to site saying, well, we've not had it verified. We need to get this sorted. Oh, we've got contacts in that area. We've dealt with them in the past. We deal with them all the time. So a um, little bit tangled, but I'm sure people will come back to me and say, no, that line should go there and this person should go here. But I just thought I'd put that as a, the key players that are there and, and how they, they might map out into the program. So just kind of summarizing all that so verification in the initial engagement side of things the prerequisites and 735 demands that the the verifier can competently produce a verification plan for all aspects of the system so it says all aspects of the system even though 8485 just mentions the two points um against membranes it's the whole system so with ventilation sub uh, the structure that forms this. So we could say the design and specification compliance, the understanding of the SI, it's quite key that the verification uh, officer knows this, this element. And we've also got the competencies there. We want to start checking the competencies of the people that are going to do our next construction phase part of the project. Not only the verifier, we hope they've you know earned their stripes, but also the, the installers that are going to do it because that does play out as well in 735 and we'll bring that one up. So we need to start knowing how things are going to be put together. Installation methods. On-site health and safety is a major one that I often see kind of 
um, overlooked when the verifiers might come on site. They're not fully aware of you know the hazards that are associated with us. We are in a risky environment. Then they must be able to implement and deliver the verification. So what they've said in their initial engagement, they're actually going to conduct that on site. So that's going to be their testing regimes and their uh, visual, whatever inspection they need to do against their professional um, uh, professional risk assessment of the uh, lost lost me words there really the professional uh, professional based judgment of how much they need to do for against the site that they're working on. So not all verification of every site is the same. It's all going to be different. Yeah. And also the, the hot topic, non-conformance resolution. So how are you going to res resolve these problems? We often come up against uh, technicians that might have left site that we're trying to deal with. Um, so trying to resolve a problem that's there on site, you, you ultimately end up having a game of uh, repair tennis going on. That they come back and repair it, but can you come back and see them repair it and double check it again? So it could become a, a costly and timely exercise just to do that and then we've got the final reporting so again pretty important that all the prerequisites and the site-based evidence can be put together for that final report so is everything designed as intended so when you look at the the site when you walk on there you have an understanding of what that floor structure is going to be and there we can see a traditional block and beam floor being put in by um, a ground groundworks team which you would expect there's going to be subfloor ventilation of a specific amount. You could measure it at this point. You could see that it's nice and clear. Not like some people do where they top it up with all the nasty hydrocarbon hotspot that they can't take down to the local tip. Um, and they use that as backfill to try and fill the holes underneath the floor. That's a good point to check it there. On the right, we can see some vibro piling, which is, again, a, a standard construction method. If in the right geology, this might be a suitable method. But they're also known, they're very prominent preferential pathways into the under floor areas of a building. So you would look at that in the initial risk assessment of what you're doing and what your risk assessor has told you, that that piling might not be appropriate with the ground gas situations you're working with. Ventilation, again, going round, are air bricks installed? Is cross ventilation available? I often ask this to verifiers when they're, they're looking for that elusive pinhole in a membrane that, oh, have you counted all the air bricks? You know, just as a courtesy, because I know technicians out there will count them because they, they will put it on their CQA for their sign off. Uh, but often I don't see this. Um, and on the right there, we can see the cusp bait and it's actually lying the way that it unrolls from the sheet. So, you know, because of manufacturing processes, they can't roll it the way you need it to lay for gas protection. Um, ideal for drainage, but it needs to be flipped over. So when we turn it round, We'll have it the right way round. But on some structures, this might be put in by other trades. Other trades might not necessarily understand, as I said in the, the initial slide, they won't understand what the ground gas hazard is. Why is this being put in? Why is it so important? This could be scoring quite a few points for you in your system, especially if you're looking for higher, higher end scores. So have you got means of checking that? Should your planning also look at when can you go and see this uh, subfloor void being put in? Yeah. The membranes. Again, I've heard cases of sites just saying, well, we're going to put this membrane in because this is the one we used last time and it was really good and it's really cheap and we can get we've still got two and a half rolls of it. So we're going to put this one in again. Knowing the right membranes for the right environment, you know, orange membrane with foil or yellow one with reinforcing. Well, you know, these are again, we should have done this at our initial stage. We don't want to be getting a shock when we turn up on site and you see something completely different from what you expected. That's where the verifier has to, you know, put the flag in the air and say, stop, what's going on here? What's changed? There might be a genuine change in specification that you've not been notified of, but you need to be aware of that. And I always like to look back at little projects I've done previously. And this, this one cropped up in London in the mid nineties, mid to late nineties. And we got, you know, you get nice design drawings. So for verifiers, there was no verifier on this job, but we did have a, a, a an RE on site, resident engineer. We also had a clerk of works on this particular project. It was the Millennium Dome in London. Now working there, we had a lot of trenches and a lot of, a lot of complicated areas. But if you were to take a verification scenario of looking at that job, how do you plan your visits when you've got a big circular build like that? 
with a lot of trenches, a lot of cutouts, a lot of pipes. There's, there's, you know, lots of things going on there. To try and plan and sequence your visits with the installation can be quite difficult. So knowing what to expect is, is a key role for the verifier. Yeah. So the installation methods, when we look at the building types and the methods, the sequencing. So here we've got two examples of very differing structures. We've got a steel frame, more of an industrial building on the left against a more, well, a timber frame structure for residential purposes. Um, so in this particular environment, knowing how are they going to sequence their work? Will you need to do one visit? Will you need to do three, three visits? Will you need to do five visits? Um, because often with timber frame, for example, perimeters might be put in first to allow all the build process to go on. The screeds of the building won't go in until the final, the, the, the roof's on where it's dry and clean. But a lot of new house builders now, we know that they will try and put the screeds down very early in the build process before the structure's gone up. So sequencing that is a verifier's role to know when do I need to be there? When's the best time? Yeah. And installation methods. So early stages in our prerequisite phase, we should be asking how the installers, how the manufacturer recommending that details will be performed. So you can see there some pipe details and uh, an acoustic robust detail between a party wall in two properties. Very standard you know, practice, but seeing how the technician actually detailed that drop, and that's, that's a 225 drop in the membrane there. So it's quite difficult. That was actually preformed by the technician out of, the, out of that location and planted in afterwards. Seeing the welding methods, um, and I've got two examples there. In the middle, we can see a, a, a twin seam fusion heat welding system, and on the right, some tape jointing. So understanding the working methods, seeing a method statement or an installation plan from your technicians that clearly states we are going to be tape jointing um, in accordance with the manufacturer, Whereas actually the manufacturer might not be specifying tape because of the environment you're in. VOCs being the classic example where tape jointing isn't um, the ideal or isn't a, a, you know, a system we should be looking at. When you have heat welding systems, hopefully you've got some more confidence that uh, everything's going to be to a much better standard. And then we've also got how they're going to detail to pipes, uh, sorry, col column details, the superstructure of a building. You can see in that photograph there on the left, with the white membrane around the base of a steel plate. Again, pockets, that was a very awkward sequencing there because the way they did the pour. Pipe clusters, or are they pipes? They could be service ducts, we don't know. <laughs> Again, looking to the drawings, the installers might not understand the, the, the complexity of what this room is. This is a high voltage switch room bringing in armored cables. So, you know, the engineers looked at that and they felt there was quite a high risk with receptor pathways coming into such a high risk room. So this actually got diverted into the outside of the building. Quite a significant design change, but it got done. In the center, we can see cuspate being laid correctly, the right uh, way around, which is good to see. Quite nice little shots actually to include into your verification reports as you're going on your site visit. We don't have to photograph every, every column, every pipe, every detail, but a cross section with good explanations and understanding the working detail it corresponds to the installation method it corresponds to the manufacturer's guided um, parameters it, it's what we need to know and ultimately what will be required in the final report yeah so standard details might be used or some bespoke details um, because things change and it, it can get complicated so when i talk about generic and dynamic ver verification plans I've often heard when the phone call comes in at the last minute to say, we need we need this gas membrane verified. Can you do it? And I get asked this question often. <laughs> I don't. It's not my role to go. I don't verify gas membranes. I support the technicians. Um, but I say, well, when are you going to go and look at the membrane? Oh, well, they did it two two days ago and I'm just going now. Um, is it going to be all right? Well, first of all, following up that you've got access to uh, guidance and information. That's not really the way you should be doing it. Um, Caveats in your verification plan should you should be looking at all these. Every project is is so so different. Yeah, site investigation, building types, size, time frame, components, technician skills, the clients are all going to be different. So hence me using a, a crosshead screwdriver to try and put a, a, a flat screw in, it ain't going to work. And so often I see inappropriate verification plans just 
kind of generic plans put out all the jobs. They have to be like dynamic because ultimately your installers, and I look at this when uh, I'm doing the MBQ level twos, the installers are looking at the verification plan or their project manager, management will be to understand what are they going to hit me with when they turn up on site. But maybe we've got other routes to improve that. Maybe we should look about doing pre-start meetings. Now, how many verifiers out there are doing a pre-start meeting where everybody in the design team, in the in the, the detail, all the individual details sit around and have a good old chat they run through the drawings, they look at details, they talk about it. Everybody knows what everybody else is doing. They're few and far between, I'm afraid. And when I was last installing, which, well, I still go out and install um, or support installers, I very I asked them, have you taken part in a verification planning pre-start meeting? No, never heard of one. The first thing they hear is the verifier turning up on site, n not even a plan. Yeah. There are plans out there, people do do it. But here on the right, we can see a good example of um, a, a board bid, you know, like a sample board of all the materials that are being used, the labels of those materials, the lapping, the, what is expected of all the team on, on site. So ultimately, the verifier, hopefully they've got this before they come to site, but they will be able to interpret that information back to what's actually being delivered on site. They're verifying um, what's been validated as a as a design. Yeah. So. Back to 735, we use this figure here. I think we've we've touched on certainly the gas regime elements, um, looking at the, the risks from high to low, the complexity of the design we've looked at as well, you know, how, how you're gonna form all these funny shapes and round the corners. But then the installation, so bottom right, installation workforce, it clearly states um, about it either being a non-specialist or a skilled workforce. So the skilled workforce is our friendly um, MPQ level two, so you can ideally be checking these before you turn up on site. There's nothing worse than you making a judgment that your risk assessment and your planned verif your pl verification planning hasn't incorporated who the workforce are. So you come and meet the ground worker doing the, the work and suddenly it's shock and horror, poor quality work, and you're only going to do two visits. Yeah, suddenly you have to change that plan. So back to your caveats. But checking this before you go to site, I, I often used to get called for these when I when I was previously contracting. Can we see proof of all the workforce competencies? It's like your PQQs, really. Yeah. So demonstrating either through the certificate here, you can see the MVQ2, or through the um, the CSCS card system, uh, which is available to check now. You can get the online app to do that. So it's always worth having a little little look to see what the technician's competencies are, because blue cards. It's the endorsement on the back is the critical part. Yeah. So in 735, we've broken down um, the this is a kind of CS2 environment. So um, a domestic dwelling where the general builder is going to put the gas protection in. And it clearly states there that there should really be 100 percent of visual inspections of all plots by the verifier. Yeah. So they're going to be very stringent with all of that. Whereas the qualified workforce and the experience, so at least one member of the installation crew has got the MVQ2, you can see the, the dramatic drop there, 25 to 50% of visual inspections. But both those elements carry the requirement for the installer to provide some form of evidence, CQA, sign-off sheets, photographs, whatever. Now, I have never encountered a ground worker that's done that or a screeder or a... Um, whatever trade, <laughs> plasterer, whoever's had a go at putting the gas membrane, certainly in that general builders, uh, ground workers stage. But the sign off sheets, it's again a mandatory um, requirement for the MVQ level two that we see some form of checking, checking their work, but also signing it off. That could be with the site, site manager or just an internal process for, for the individual's company. So they've got some form of CQA construction quality assurance in place. But I want to put some positives on this because, you know, when we go on site, we're looking at the general scope of it. And these are three examples of projects that I've worked on where um, you can see on the left, we've got a brick layer busily putting up his internal brick uh, block work skin. Um, but look at that. He's got some nice insulated boards over the membrane. A gentleman in the middle doing a bit of hoovering for us before um, we're about to put the membrane in and really nice subgrade. And here we can see a steel fixer. 
And these only came around because of good planning, because of talking to the site at the very early stages, letting them know what the ground gas, the risk was, letting them know that the membranes need to go in, they must stay intact. They are quite fragile. We all know that. Yeah. But these are good examples that are actually included into verification reports um, to say, look, the site was really good. And that gives us confidence throughout the job that we're going to, you know, they're going to maintain that standard. So implementing and deliver. How do we go about checking? Well, we often meet verifiers on site. They should be using um, appropriate and proportionate um, methods to the risks. So obviously a CS1, 2, they will be using a lot, you know, less um, arduous methods, i.e. picking and probing, as we can see there. Visual inspections is always a very good way for everybody to move forward. I think we can all do visual inspections. We all do it when we paint a wall at home. We look at it. Have we missed a bit? Oh, yeah. Get the roller out, <laughs> do a bit more. But the same on site. And here we can see some mechanical stress point testing. But some more rigorous testing that might be required. Here we've got some dielectric or spark testing, as some people refer to it. We've got air lancing. Common tool that's often used, um, testing the seams. So they, they're two very different systems because the air lancing is very good for detailing and for the seam sections, whereas the um, dielectric testing is for more of the cover, the whole area, and it will detect through an electric current and shorting out the current under the floor. But then on the right, we can see some testing of the seams that are carried out through um, actually injecting a needle and pressure, pressurizing the seams. So twin seam welding is ideal if this is the method that you're going to, you know, use, to adopt to uh, conduct your testing. Yeah. But then we also have um, other methods which might be, you know, these are for higher risk sites where you really got to make sure everything's a OK and 100 um, percent. So here we've got a bit of trace gas testing going on. And in this particular instance on the on the left, it's a new build site. So. We can see the, the technician firing up the test equipment there to inject a known gas, which is good. They will go around and conduct their test appropriately. If we look on the right, some of these tests can actually be um, modified. And a few of the specialist um, consultancies out there that do verification have methods of going into a building after it's constructed. Because believe you me, there is a lot of properties that do have membranes allegedly put in. The house is finished, especially show houses for some reason. And then they're asked to come and validate afterwards. The floor screws down. Can you validate? Now, this is a tool they can use. Um, and I'm sure that some of them will have other tools that they will advise on. But you can see the testing being carried out there internally using some monitoring equipment that's sens sensitive to the, the known trace gas that they're using. So within um, 735, it uses a lot of the ASTM, which is the American Society for Testing Materials methods they are quite common and um, they've drawn on a lot of you know good practice that's out there um quite some of it's used in the actual material testing side of things some of it is used in the on-site testing so for example the one that i've highlighted there d4437 is 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 the air lancing test um these are tried and tested and been adopted so they've been incorporated um into 735 and they're used um appropriately and that's a key thing that you will be stating which systems you want to use. I've seen some verification plans where every system in the book has been put on. So, for example, vacuum box testing is, is mentioned. Um, I can honestly say I've only ever seen vacuum box testing when I've been on a landfill project, which is common practice, but it's not been used on a gas membrane. So um, it's, it's knowing how these methods work. So understanding them. The other thing that some people talk to me about is, well, we get somebody else to do this for us. Well, that's that's OK, because the technicians to carry around all the equipment to do air lancing, for example, um, some technicians will have this on their van, some of the installation technicians. But you might be called in to audit that process to see that they're doing it correctly. Mm -hmm. So looking at the, the the equipment they've got, how they got it set up, how are they running? It's all pretty important, you know, auditing that process. Again, that, that's the same that operates for integrity gas testing, that you can audit that process if, if it's being done by a third party. Yeah. So um, but also there's some British standards that, that exist in 735 as well, which give insights um, to various testing uh, regimes. Again, looking at the material testing there as well, which is, is quite useful to break them down, look at them individually to see what that actually does mean. Yeah. 
Understanding as well the differences where you've got radon and VOCs in the environment. So we're back to a, a dynamic risk assessment here because obviously radon is quite a difficult one to trace, especially, you know, normally you have to wait till the building's up to do this. But 735 states that we should be appointing similar practices in how we check the membranes, certainly, and also how the consideration is for the ventilation and the structure, because the point scoring, this sits slightly out of 8485, but slightly in 8485. So it mentions it, but doesn't, you know, so it's it's one of them kind of on the touch lines, especially with VOCs, more rigorous testing required in there because the testing is, is very, not the verification testing, but the actual site investigation testing is done not and it doesn't comply to the the cs stand cs one to six for example yeah vocs is vocs so non-conformance we need to put these right now how are we going to do that well there's um a few situations here well here we go putting this right as well imagine turning up on site um 735 it's it's no good this should be avoided at all cost um, I've managed, I've got a, a collection of these actually, when I see laser screed operations going on or flood pours in this situation, I can't see the screeder actually present, um, but driving lorries on, it's no good being the, the king of hindsight at the on the far side there to say, you shouldn't have done that. You, you the verifier, should have noticed this early stages when you looked at the sequence of work, like I showed you, um, at the pre-start meeting saying, well, guys, how are you going to flood pour this? Why isn't there a pump being brought in with just one operative or two operatives working the slab? So the poor technicians might stand there going, well, this is how we've been told to do it. We've got no other option. You know, the timings might have been worked out that way as well. So it's a, it's a real difficult scenario. Yeah. So we should avoid that at all costs. You need to caveat how are these repairs going to be covered. Ideally, you would be mentioning back to the um, installer's installation plan method statement because they should um, state in there what their parameters are for repairing patches pinholes etc how they're going to reseal it are they going to cover it with self-adhesive are they going to weld a patch on etc etc there's a lot of caveats that might be covered from both them and from you yeah and again another non-conformance here i mentioned them earlier where we saw the cluster of 10 pipes um i've seen verifiers walk past these pipes just assuming that they're just a pipe no action taken. I have actually seen some very good practice recently where um, a, a, a notice was put on the pipes to indicate that this is a service duct. This isn't complete. Before this property is completely signed off by us, we need either a, a final inspection or we need evidence that it has been capped or sealed because there's going to be another pipe uh, within that as a service entry. Yeah. And then our installers, well, the, hopefully when I work with the level twos, that they're putting some good evidence together of the work they've done. If you ever pinch an installer's phone, there's always a raft of really good pictures of gas membranes. Some of them crop up more than once on verification reports, <laughs> joking apart. But seeing evidence from the installers, if they put something together like this, and I did this one a few years ago in the West Midlands where I live, um, I've used a drawing to locate the actual um, elements of repair or, or detail, and I've done a sign-off sheet. So this is my CQA that goes in my folder. You as the verification officer might call this in to say, I want a copy of this. Um, but you want to call this in early in, in your verification planning, saying all evidence, because 735 asks for it, evidence of sign offs, e evidence of work is there. Yeah. So as we say, I've, I've just cut and pasted that bit there, installer to provide the evidence. So the final part really is the verification report. This is a key part where you're going back to your office. You've gathered lots of evidence. As I say, we don't want a picture of every column or every post, but we need a good rounded overall um, detailed, you know, smart almost. You know, it's specific. It's measured. It's got all the all the elements in there. You know, it, it's genuine product to form that one jigsaw piece, because this is the key that's going to unlock that discharge of planning condition, because we know there are conditions put on sites that we're working on. These need to be um, fulfilled. And again, the diligence of our local authority will, will, you know, say yay or nay, whether they accept it or not. They might look at some reports that could be one page with a couple of pictures. Sorry, that isn't sufficient. Yeah. So really having a, having a good report in place is a key final stage of the whole process. Yeah. So it's more than about finding that pinhole. I've got a man here looking for a needle in a haystack. Yeah. Plan, instigate, report. So final reports, 
site investigation, testing inspection, non-conformance, installation methods, design and specification. These are all big you know, areas. You'll be doing a lot of work before you even step foot on site. And often the membrane element is actually one of the latter parts of the, the verification process. When you've got a structure to look at, some ventilation to consider, all the precursors that go there. So just a little polite reminder here, and this happened uh, two years ago up in Scotland. Um, project manager jailed after faking verification reports. And those who wish to read through it's there, but the basically the, the actual um, contractor, I don't know what happened with the verification reports, whether they failed to call in the verifier, but they fraudulently um, made up verification final reports to submit. Um, and that put 11 families at risk. And the, the thing was, this happened in Midlothian, where we all know there's Gorebridge. <laughs> this happened in the same local authority region. So I think they were pretty hot and, and rightly so. But you can see there that the, the gentleman actually served a seven month sentence for his attempt to fraudulently um, do these, doc, uh, create these documents. And ultimately, um, it's we're working for the safety of the people that are going to occupy that home. We're working for the safety of the home as well. We don't want it to go bang. <laughs> so that was um, a little closing reminder for you. And I've just circled them off there. So that is everything from me, guys. Um, hopefully it's been helpful. It's been a bit, a bit of a whistle stop run through verification for you. But um, thanks for your your time. Um, and by all means, there's my contact details. And I'm going to call in Andy now to uh, to do our final final part. So you there, Andy? I certainly am. Neil, many, many thanks for that presentation. I mean, I have to say, I'm no techie. Those that know me know that I'm no techie. However, I, even someone like me, is aware of the jigsaw when it comes to design and installation. But on that image of the cement truck, my word, I mean, even someone with me with basic knowledge knows how much of a daft move that is. I mean, that's a prime example, a prime example of, of why the PCA is trying to help come in here and, and, and help bring better standards. And if you don't, I mean... I'll probably nick that image, I think, and use it for social media, I think, um, Neil, and uh, emphasise your presentation a little bit more. <laughs> by all means, Andy, by all means. <laughs> and I think we all got a new word of the day from you, report tennis, smacking the catch-22 tennis ball back. <laughs> That's it. Your turn. My turn. I'll come back. Yeah, reporting tennis. Yeah. God, my comments are so sad. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, guys, on to question time. Now, Neil, we've had quite a wee variety of questions coming via um, both email and um, via the chat windows. Guys, for anyone that wants to kind of pose any questions just while we're going through questions, please feel free to do so. You can either just fire it um, via the chat functionality or um, via email by also picking them up via social media. I suppose first question, first, first question comes from Martin Freeman. Um, question's all about costs. So he's asking, what is the broad range of costs of verification, say for a small retrofit basement, single vault? Um, I, I mean, is there a rule of thumb there or is that a case of how long's a piece of string? I think it's a how long's a piece of string on that because you, you've got so many dynamics that fall in for the verification, you know, the companies that you involve, the logistics of where they are, looking at the the dynamic of the project the complexity you know how complex is it going to be a one visit job is it going to be a three visit job you know it, it's very difficult to answer that one and i get i get many people throw um drawings at me saying you know how many how many visits would you do this in well i visits as an installer or visits as a verifier because mm -hmm. if you're doing visits as an installer is your verifier going to follow up every visit and like i showed in that very first slide with the perimeter already done that's the real danger elements are in there because that's where all the detailing is, all the corners, mm -hmm. the thresholds, the changes, the turns, yet nobody verified that. The safe area, which I'm installing and can all be seen happy days, one visit and the verifier had to sign off that he was unable to, to verify the perimeters, you know, mm -hmm. and rightly so. So. Okay. Well, next question is these, by the way, these ones are from email, just first let them go in, but um, I've got two questions here from David Jackson. First question, which I actually think it might be a way to answer for you. Um, David's asking, installation and verification of gas protection measures into existing buildings and structures is technically 
and logistically very problematic for us. Can you offer any suggestions and tips to how that can be achieved? Well, David, I've got a suggestion. Training course, PTA, <laughs> the very man here is doing it. <laughs> Was that just a shameless plug there? Sorry. Terrible, terrible. No, in all seriousness, um, the, the, there's actually some new guidance that's being mm. um, written and uh, drafted at the moment. I think it's nearing its final stages of retrofitting. Mm. Now, British Standard 8485 is very kind of new build and um, for carbon dioxide and methane. Mm. Whereas the uh, new Syria document, when it gets released, is going to be look at retrofitting environments. Um, I know that it slowed up a little bit because of COVID and the lockdown. Um, they've had a, an online meeting, I heard. But there's going to be some uh, guidance put in place there. Um, yeah, they are very difficult. I've worked on numerous ones and uh, the number of times pen and paper have, have gone and sketches and details. I think this new guidance might have some uh, some input that will, will assist on that coming forward, hopefully. Yeah, crossing fingers. Well, David also poses another quick question, which is once installed and verified, what legal mechanisms are available to ensure measures remain effective into the future? Ooh, get the crystal ball out here, Neil. Yeah, well, it's, it's one that I'm looking at for the, the detail and design courses. It's like the warranties and guarantees. Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know, the, the, the membrane manufacturers will guarantee a product that comes out the factory, but the minute it touches the ground on the site, you know, you, you're reliant on a good subgrade, well installed by, you know, technicians that know what they're doing, how to handle it, how to install it. It's, it's a very, very difficult one. And it's unless you put a deck chair and sit there until it's covered in concrete, knowing that it's 100 percent safe, it's, it's a really, really awkward one. Again, I always throw it back to um, toolbox talks, speaking to the people, the site management team. I can say 50 percent of the sites I go on, they still say to me and I've been, you know, in the industry quite a while have said this is the first time we put a gas membrane in. Don't know what it's all about. So you have to go back to stage one and say, guys, you know, so it's it's really at the end of the day, the systems are designed in such a way that is a pinhole in that membrane going to, you know, cause a fatality within 20 hours or something, you know, of gas getting in there. But the system is designed in such a way that, yes, we don't want to be trashing membranes, but you want a structure that performs to its requirements. You want a uh, ventilation that performs and you want a membrane that performs. If they all work, then they're doing over and above what they need to. So, you know, it's it's down to that um, sign off by the local authority, but putting the report in showing good practice, it's really as much as they can do as the verifiers. They're not going to keep going back again until the day it's concreted. Yeah. yeah, Neil, this is actually more a question for myself than anyone else, but just goes off the back of David's question. Um, and again, guys, I'm going to tell you, I am not a techie. I am not a professional ground gas person, but I'm going to throw it out there. I mean, I, I, in terms of once things have been installed and looking into the future, is ground gas a bit like knotweed where there's almost that like you go back and year one, year two, year three, year four, just to make sure that and detect whether or not there is any problems? There's obviously if you if that's in a um, a, a type A building, which is a domestic mm. dwelling, no, it's never going to get looked at. Hence, why mm. the design is the way the design is. But if the if the buildings are um, of a higher risk variety, you know, so you um, C and D where they've got or A or B, sorry, where you've got a managed system potentially in place that you can somebody will be monitoring that, checking it. So if there's a ventilation system that's put in that's managed, it has to be serviced and you have to prove that the system still fit for purpose, especially, you know, public buildings or, or high risk buildings. Um, but n there's no checks, um, only those that are put in by management systems to, to look after properties. Yeah. OK, moving on to the next question. Um, got a couple of questions here from Patrick Flood. I'm going to pre-warn you here, pa pa Patrick and yourself, Neil. These ones are to do with insurances. And if I've learned anything in terms of insurances, we have to tiptoe around about these areas because insurance companies can be nippy little sweethearts, but I'll throw it out to you the now, Neil, and you can see what you can answer here. And just also let you know, there's been a great a chat about this as well, both from Paul Green, John Sparks, and a couple of others out there. But question is, um, what insurances should an installer have? And how is this checked as part of the verification? And also, would a grounds works company have this type of insurance? So, well, 
I think it goes back to the, the initial P, PI and public liabilities. That, yeah. <laughs> that That's the initial one that everybody, you know, legally has a duty to to ensure themselves and, and um, that they're covered um, as, a, as a moral duty as well as a legal duty to the business. Now, declaring what practices they do, have all companies been, you know, like Groundwork has been upright with their insurance brokers and said, oh, by the way, we're doing ground gas protection. No, it would be... Uh, I, I can't answer this because every insurance company will have relationships with their their uh, their clients. Mm. You know, it, it's such a difficult one to answer. Every case is going to be very, very unique. Whereas, you know, if you are a specialist, if your banner says that you are a spe specialist gas membrane installer, then you would have thought the insurance company would be looking at you saying, right, you're working in quite a high risk sector here. You know, um, it's, would you check the insurances of the company? PQQs do it mm. in, in the build process. So, you know, for verifiers, would that be a good practice? I'm, I'm putting it back out because surely that question has been thrown to a lot of um, material. I know material suppliers have been asked for their, you know, guarantees of their product that's going to last, i.e., you know, the life of the building or 50 years or whatever. But again, failures against um, technicians' competencies. Yeah, the verifier is going to be checking the worlds and checking all the work. And does it take the onus off of the installers once that verifier's walked on site and signed their sign-off sheet? Or for the 75% of work that they're not inspected, that they've relied on the installer to give them good CQA to, to forward? You know, it's it, it's a real tricky one. I'm, I'm sorry I can't. It's one I'd like to speak to Patrick on sometime. <laughs> yeah, no, no. And it's one of these things like, oh, God. You know, I've, we've had these insurance questions beforehand, and they're always mother. But and say, you've actually kind of in part also answered um another question that patrick was asking but you may want to expand on it which was um part b to that was is you know is it part of the should it be part of the verification company's brief to check if an installer has the relevant insurance well there's is, is there anything to stop them to do over and above what guidance you know it's mm. it's not prescribed in in 735 you must check your insurances but for a for a company to do that, they could they could write it in their verification plan, and when they're making all their phone calls to the various uh, de uh, detailing elements, say by the way, we we want to check the competencies of your installer. Can we see that either their MVQ certificates or their CSES reference? By the way, insurances for this as well, because you know it's where does that buck stop? Isn't the client going to want that, or? Is the verifier reliant on what the PQQ's done as the tier or as the main contractor asking that question? You know, are they just assuming? I don't know. It's it's one possibly to sit with people in that that industry in the verification world that might want to to take that on board and uh, steer steer practice on that. You know, guidance on that element. Okay. Well, here we just have one that's popped in from Ben. Ben, good morning, Ben. Ben's by the way for those not Ben is actually doing our next webinar in a month's time. Ben's asking, Neil, I, I am looking at a verification report which doesn't explain how it was verified. I assume just a visual inspection. This doesn't seem sufficient to me. What are your thoughts? I'll throw it back to them and say, well, can you explain? I'll ask, ask the question back to the, the alleged verification um, consultant engineer say what well, you know, have you got your, you, you could cast it all the way back to the prerequisites, you know, do you know what the site scenario is the si do you know what the design have it, it it's replicating that it's you you know you're almost acting like you know the regulator would do um mm. i know there used to be a regulator in the uh, norfolk area really really strict on it if it if it didn't tick all the boxes sorry it's going back again to the person that submitted it and i'm going to ask the following questions you know mm -hmm. so yeah well here neil um i'm hoping you can maybe give quick answers here because i am conscious of time um, folks, just to let you know that we do have a couple of questions I'm probably not going to be able to answer, but I'll pass them over to Neil and I'll let him get back to you. But um, first question, actually, um, um, it comes via social media and it's basically asking you, um, Neil, you made reference to radon being very difficult to check and test for. Can you advise what are these difficulties? Well, it's it's mainly on the um, conceptual site model side because uh, I think it's and I'm not a site investigation specialist here, but whenever I talk to colleagues in that domain, you know, radon is one of those. They'd be either referring to the radon map of the UK, previous records in that area, looking at the geology. So until you put the receptor up, you don't know what the what amount of radon, if if any, 
is going to be put into you know into the building so designing systems into that often have to be you know either i think they they use well they use the term uh, basic or full protection you know depending on where they want to go so do, does everybody go well i'm going to put basic protection in because then i've got something in there and it ticks a box but if that test the building afterwards and they st find that there's still a problem have they got any full protection systems to fall back on so i think it's knowing that you know borehole testing and so on for radon it's it's very rare you know it's more of a um a site investigation done off of historical maps and geology and so on you know so um it, it it's notorious. I, I would. I've got a colleague that I could pass that one on to you <laughs> for you mm. if you needed more more advice on that side of things. I have um, a contact on that that side of. of no, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Again, conscious of time, mate. I'm going to throw out the last question just to let everyone know we are just running a couple of minutes over. Uh, comes from Patrick again. Patrick, big thanks for all your questions. Um, it's kind of tying it back to insurance, though. Um, so I will pre warn you. Question is if. Uh, a verification office, uh, if a verification officer doesn't check the insurance and it turns out the contractor isn't insured and a failure occurs, would a verifier be liable for the sign off? Oh, oh. Well, <laughs> question that one, be careful. <laughs> I I, I I won't give an answer to that one because that that's a real poison chalice that job there yes right? yes i do i agree with you in that one patrick um um if you're if you want to throw out your opinion on this one we're more than happy to hear it just join the chat on this one and stick it in there but guys um, as i mentioned we will uh, i will pass over these other questions that we've got for for neil um and um, if neil can get back to you i'm not going to make any promises then great Guys, I have just uh, just might point you to a couple of additional information sources that you can look at. We have at the PCA some professional ground gas pages now. You can see the URL just up on the screen. It's just property-care.org forward slash professionals forward slash ground gas. Um, you heard us mention about it earlier on, but we do have a, a new code of practice for ground gas coming along. Neil, along with the, the working group, um, are currently working on it at the moment. I suspect that that, that is coming out imminently. Um, Neil, you might be able to advise a wee bit better on that one. But oh, oh sorry, you're going to. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> but also, just to let you know, we do have a replay of this available as well, coming out so that you can share. But for those of you that are interested, we do have some really good training courses of which Neil is actually heading up. We've got a brand new one coming up in about four weeks' time, which is Ground Gas Design in Detail. It's a full two-day course. You can check it out just if you go via our training pages. But we also have one of our more existing ones in there, which is Ground Gas Protection Measures, Installation and Verification. Again, just go to our website and you'll be able to check it out. Uh, we are also open up for Ground Gas membership as well. If that is of interest to you, um, simply just contact us at the PCA just on 01480 400 000 or visit any of our contact pages or membership pages. Um, our, uh, our next webinar coming up is on the 27th of August. This time we now switch back over to waterproofing, as you heard me say earlier on. Our very own um, Ben Hickman, uh, who's on the, the PCA Board of Directors, is leading this one up. It's all about watertight, um, watertight concrete. Are you specifying the correct type B waterproofing? Um, for anyone that wants to join, the URL is just down there. Just go to property-care.org forward slash webinars. Um, last but not least, I just want to say a big thank you from myself and everyone at the PCA, um, Neil, for the presentation. Um, it's been a pleasure having you back on board again um and a big big good luck with the new training course that's coming up um i just want to say to the audience a big thank you for kind of tuning in to us and uh, lastly but not least uh, i suppose it's a goodbye for myself a goodbye from neil and hopefully we see you in the next webinar in about four weeks time so bye everyone thanks everyone bye now <laughs>